Thank you very much, Jane, for that kind introduction. And I will just apologise in advance with my throat playing up slightly today. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here today. And I want to also start by thanking your leader, Anne Lucas, Colleen Fletcher, um, Jane and Fidel, and many of those who have been involved in putting to this to, uh, conference together today. I'm delighted to be here as the Shadow Minister for Preventing Violence Against Women and Girls, part of a commitment made by our Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, and Ed Miliband to put the safety of women at the heart of our vision for the work of the Home Office. I'm proud also to share this room with inspiring and tireless campaigners on the issue of female genital mutilation and with those of you who in your professional roles have the capacity to make a difference to the lives of women and girls in your community. Let us be in no doubt. Female genital mutilation is an abhorrent act of violence against women. It is a crime and, it is an end, and its end is a matter for us all. We know that thousands of girls in Britain are at risk, but it is something that we can change by breaking the cycle for the next generation. I congratulate Coventry on this groundbreaking conference and the clear determination of local leaders to lead the change here. The fact that you also took a motion through full council last year is not just symbolic, but is, a, I think, a sign of what councils can do and the statements they make. Female genital mutilation has been illegal in the UK since 1985 under the Female Genital Mutilation Act. This legislation was extended by Labour in 2003 to include anyone taking a girl or woman outside of the UK to perform FGM. It is estimated over 125 million women around the world have been cut in the 29 countries in Africa and the Middle East where FGM is concentrated. And far from being a safe procedure, the health impacts continue through life. Depending on the type of FGM performed, it can lead to painful menstruation if there is only a tiny hole left after infibulation, urine retention and urinary tract infections. Prolonged school absences are not uncommon, affecting a girl's life chances and economic potential. This then holds back the economic progress of communities as families remain poorer. FGM can lead to painful sex later in life and even the need for forcible penetration using scissors or a knife. And far from making childbirth safer, which is one of the myths of FGM, a woman is 70% more likely to suffer a hemorrhage after giving birth, twice as likely to die during childbirth, or give birth to a stillborn. And this is even without factoring in the traumatic stress disorder and depression that so many suffer. And many women do not even associate their health conditions with the female genital mutilation that they were subject to as girls. Those who are survivors have for generations suffered in silence behind closed doors. Now we have moved a long way to even be here today and I pay tribute to the campaigners locally and nationally who have fought tirelessly to raise the profile of this issue and push it high on the political agenda of both sides of the House of Commons. One key issue we face as politicians is the strength of the evidence base about the prevalence. In order to make the public policy case for resources, whether locally or nationally, data is vital. And since April the 1st this year, Health professionals have had a duty to record instances of FGM, particularly in hospitals. It gives us some of the most reliable data possible, and this has already made a difference. And whilst this is not a solution to the problem, the collection of data by hospitals and where possible by GPs is helping to measure the scale of the problem and inform our response to it. As data becomes more reliable, so the case for joined up strategies becomes clearer. Local safeguarding boards are able to have the information that they need to engage with local communities at risk and to target where girls are at risk and work with services to raise awareness and the knowledge for how to intervene. 
Girls born to mothers who are survivors of FGM are more at risk of being cut. <clears throat> there is also a point that is often raised in dialogue on this issue or other aspects of violence against women and girls, like forced marriage or even domestic violence. I know that years ago, domestic violence happened in my wider family, witnessed by my relatives' children, who finally took a stand when they grew up. When they raised it as children, they were listened to, but change was slow because it was so culturally commonplace and there were few tools to address it. Where an excuse is shared that it is cultural practice, or if it's culturally, or sometimes if it's seen as culturally acceptable, then it becomes easier that we all turn a blind eye. But as someone who is British, born in Britain, and of Asian heritage, let me say quite categorically that there is no cultural excuse for violence against women and girls. Whether in London, Coventry, Rotherham, India, Somalia, or the Middle East, the cause is one. And ahead of November the 25th, I think we can all renew our commitment to doing all that we can to see an end to violence against women in all its forms. But change needs to come from within our communities themselves. There can be communities where issues have only just started to be tackled, others where the means and resources have been too limited to have an impact. But there can be a tragedy too far or a situation beyond our, imag uh, beyond our imagination that become points of no return. The savage, the savage bus rape of a young woman in India two, two Christmases ago galvanized a nation in its resolve to no longer turn a blind eye or continue to accept such widespread sexual abuse. And this year, the Indian Prime Minister made the safety of women a central theme in his first Independence Day speech, where he offered parents some advice on how to bring up better sons. When we hear about these rapes, our heads hang in shame, he said. In every home, Parents ask daughters lots of questions as to where is she going, when will she return, and ask her to inform them when she reaches her destination. But have you ever asked your son where he is going, why he is going, and who are his friends? After all, the person committing the rape is also someone's son. I want to say a few words about Rotherham too, because we know that the Pakistani community are as horrified as wider communities with the scale and nature of the child sexual exploitation that took place. And the cultural curtain that perpetrators hid behind also hid the girls from the Pakistani community who had also been victims. And we know that child sexual exploitation is not limited to one community. Rochdale, Oxford, Operation Utree, and the scale of Jimmy Savile's abuse at the heart of our establishment, rightly sent shockwaves, and those tremors will continue to be felt for years to come. And when a community starts to address its cultural barriers to change, it should be supported and change pushed forward with the support of politics and our public services. Now, tackling FGM has not been an easy journey for the campaigners for change. But from their story, I know a tide is turning. Men and women who have bravely taken steps forward will be able to keep going with the support that they have received from politics and from all of you. While some individuals will quote religion in justifying this practice, Islam does not, in fact, promote or justify FGM. Many non-Muslim countries practice FGM just as many Muslim countries do not. I attended the launch last month of the End FGM campaign in London with Nimco Ali, Jude Kelly, and others at the London South Bank. The support for this campaign has been cross-party. Nimco talked about her journey on the path to change, the resistance she experienced from within the community. But when how politicians started to take a stand too, she started to be listened to, and others started to join her crusade. We cannot make the excuse, we cannot make the mistake of excusing cultures or communities 
on the grounds that they have different values. Britain is a liberal multicultural democracy with shared values of equality and respect for difference that has room for many beliefs and practices. But FGM and other forms of violence against women and girls do not have a place. But challenging and changing cultural attitudes can also take time and on an issue like FGM needs to be approached with sensitivity. And in the words of FGM campaigner Leila Hussein, we need to abandon the cultural attitude that FGM is an African problem. We need to stop hiding under words such as culture and community. This is a European problem and it is affecting British women and girls. The sooner we recognize that, the closer we will be to ending FGM in Britain once and for all. Now you are going to hear a lot over the course of the day about working together to tackle FGM here. The police have seen a large rise in the number of reports of girls at risk of FGM, which has more than doubled this year. And this, could be, this is more likely to be down to increasing in awareness rather than an increase in actual cases. The Coventry City Council Scrutiny Coordination Committee report on female genital mutilation that was published at the beginning of October lays out challenges and strategies. FGM is a global problem, but just as Coventry can learn from the campaigns and strategies across the world, other local authorities will be able to learn from the stand that Coventry has taken and the partnership work in progress of which today is a vital part. I look forward to staying in touch with you on your progress going forwards. And perhaps one of the more important observations I could also make about your approach, symbolized by the conference today, is the commitment to this cause at all levels of your public leadership. A criticism that some have made of multi-agency safeguarding hubs elsewhere is that they are not empowered to act fast and that they are only as good as the leadership that drives them. I know from the work in Coventry that I have seen that the MASH has been very successful in its early days, taking forward the work needed to make sure that you are able to protect the children in your city. Community confidence can take a long time to build, but a short time to fall. And in that, the roles that each and one of you, each, each and every one of you play as part of an integrated response will be vital to keeping the confidence in your strategy going forwards. So what is Labour's commitment to tackling violence against women and girls? Earlier this year, the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, announced that a Labour government would bring new legislation forward in our first Queen's speech to give better support to victims of violence and bring perpetrators to justice. Some of the measures across the board that we would propose include a new commissioner for domestic and sexual violence who would sit at the heart of government and ensure that victims' voices were heard, helping join up public services and the justice system, helping ensure that new national standards for policing would drive up performance across the board. We would also seek to introduce compulsory sex and relationship education in all state-funded schools so that young people are taught that no form of violence in relationships is acceptable. Labour has committed to introducing age-appropriate sex and relationship education from key stage one. 88% of parents want SRE to be compulsory to tackle the dangers of pornography and 86% of UK adults want SRE to be compulsory to tackle sexual consent and respectful relationships. Teachers also need more training and information to identify, for example, the signs that a girl in their class could be a potential victim of FGM. Labour has also committed to a new £3 million annual fund for refuges to support victims of domestic violence and other measures from our Labour Women's Safety Commission, led by Vera Baird QC and Diana Holland, will report in the near future. On FGM, we have also called for and supported new FGM protection orders to stop children suspected of being at risk of FGM from being taken abroad. 
That and other matters in relation to FGM will be debated further in the serious crime bill currently going through Parliament. So we have a long way to go to fully break the cycle and see an end to FGM in the UK and abroad. But I want to end with an inspirational statement made by campaigner Leila Hussein, who spoke at our Women's Safety Conference in July. A survivor of FGM and now a young mother, Leila says, I am the granddaughter of a survivor of child marriage, the daughter of a woman who was freed from child marriage. I'm the mother to a daughter who will be free from all forms of violence. It is our collective challenge to make sure that that last sentence becomes true for all girls. And I look forward to working with you to see that a positive vision of the future becomes a reality and that female genital mutilation is eliminated in Britain within a generation. Thank you.